please be seated. Turn your attention to the baptistry. Amen. Hello, church family. We're glad you're here today. Uh, I want to introduce to you uh, Miss Emma Spillman and her sister, Temperance. They are seven-year-olds that uh, when they were talking with their mom and dad uh, a couple of months ago, they knew that they needed to be saved. And so right there in their own homes, they talked uh, to mom and dad, and they prayed to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so today they come before you today to tell you that they love Jesus and they want to follow him in believer's baptism. And so, Emma, I've got a question for you this morning. My question is, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And she nods her head, yes. Awesome. Well, upon your profession of faith, I baptize baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and put your arms there. Perfect. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Good job. And we have her sister coming. Her sister Temperance is going to come as well. And she's going to hold on. There we go. Awesome. And I'm going to ask you the same exact question. Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And she says, yes. Well, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and put your hand there. There you go. Perfect. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Good job. Thank you, church family, for participating with us in baptism. Yeah, go ahead and stay in with us.
Amen. That's our prayer today, church. Uh, go ahead and grab a seat if you would, and just tell the person next to you, say, good morning. Turn to the other person on your other side and say, great morning. Amen. Uh, it's really great to see you all today. Uh, if you would, go ahead and take your Bible, and, and I'm going to have you do two things today. I believe you can do it. Uh, number one, I want you to find Genesis chapter 22, okay? Genesis 22, and uh, once you get to Genesis 22, I want you to bookmark it, uh, do something, okay? And then find John chapter 4, uh, and we're going to come back to Genesis 22 in just a little bit, but... Um, Today, I just want to say uh, welcome, and uh, you picked a good day to be in church today. You picked a good day uh, to, to watch online, number one, uh, because we got, to, uh, we got to celebrate two baptisms this morning. That was pretty awesome. Amen. Uh, it's also just been a really great week at, at New Sight. We had uh, uh, several people, a couple of people, uh, put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation this week, and that's always worth celebrating, and we can all say amen to that. And, uh, okay, that was pretty weak sauce, but uh, we'll try that again. We had a couple of people give their life to Jesus this week, and that was pretty awesome, yeah. Uh, much better, much better. Uh, and then uh, uh, another thing, so uh, for, for years and years and years, the students uh, on Wednesday nights have met over in the student center, and uh, this semester they just outgrew that, so they've had to move in here on Wednesday nights. We had like 175 students in here on Wednesday night, worshiping the Lord and listening to the gospel and, and uh, walking in their purpose, and so that's pretty cool. And, uh, and so it's just been a great week to be at church, and, and uh, today is no exception because today we're starting a brand new series called Life on purpose. And uh, we use that word purpose around here a lot. You've heard me say it a lot. And, and the reason we do is because we believe every single person in this room, everyone watching online, God has a purpose for your life. God has a, a plan for your life. And, then, and, and we believe that can be uh, discovered. And we know that to be true because it says that in the word of God. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, I really just want to dive into scripture. And I want us to kind of uh, walk through the truth of, of what God's purpose and plans are for all of our lives. And so, um, I mean, we just really believe that to be true. And uh, in fact, our, our mission statement here at New Sight is, is this, that New Sight exists to equip all people to live life on purpose by sharing the hope, healing, and love of Jesus Christ. I want us to say that together on the count of three, if you would. No, uh, one, two, three. New Sight exists to equip all people to live life on purpose by sharing the hope, healing, and and love of Jesus Christ. And those words are really intentional because New Sight does exist for all people. Uh, we exist for all ages of people. We've got the little babies in the nursery. Amen, anyone serve in the nursery? If not, and you're not serving, you should. Um, but it's a pretty good place to be. Uh, we got little babies up there. We got our senior adults, right? Uh, and we got everywhere in between. Really, New Sight's a family. And uh, every family's got little ones. Every family's got old ones. And every family's got the weird uncle, right? And we've got some weird uncles here. And you're, if you're like, who's that? It's probably you. Um, um, but uh, we exist for all people, all ages. We exist for all demographics of people. Uh, and I'm so thankful. I believe a church should look like its community. A New Sight Church looks like its community. Amen? And we've got, uh, uh, we've got a, an English-speaking service right here. We've got a Spanish-speaking service down the hallway. We've got a Korean-speaking service uh, at the other side of the campus. And I'm thankful that our, our uh, church looks like our demographic uh, in this community. And, and really, uh, a New Sight Church is a place for all people of all uh, spiritual walks of life, for people who who are like, I don't even know who this God is. I don't even know if I believe in God. They're welcome here. Amen, church. And uh, if we've got people who've been following Jesus a long time, we want to walk alongside you, help you to continue to take steps towards Jesus Christ. And so we really exist for all people. And we want to walk alongside you. We want to equip you to help you live your life on purpose, the purpose that God has for you. And one of the ways we do that is by sharing the hope, healing, and love of Jesus Christ. I believe people are looking for hope in our world. Amen. I believe people are desperate for healing in our world, amen? And I believe people are tr tr truly searching for true love, and that only comes through Jesus Christ because he died on the cross for our sins, rose from the grave, and, and he gives us eternal life because he loves us, and we can experience hope and healing through Jesus Christ. And that's the heartbeat of behind New Sight Baptist Church. And so for the next few weeks, I want us to really uh, dive into your purpose, God's purpose for your life. And today, I specifically want to uh, come to this idea or this understanding. How do you worship on purpose? 
How do you worship on purpose? If you have a bulletin, I would encourage you to take it out, take notes, uh, because I believe this is going to be really helpful for you in your walk with the Lord. But how do you worship on purpose? Now, the first question I think we need to ask is what is worship, right? I think all of us have some preconceived idea or preconceived notion of, about what worship is. When you hear the word worship, there's probably something that comes to your mind. And, and maybe for you, uh, your mind instantly goes towards music. Music. I think a lot of people, that's what comes to mind when you hear worship, you think about music. Maybe you understand worship to be that time before service where we do the Christian karaoke with the lyrics on the screen before the weird guy gets up and he speaks for far too long. Maybe that's your idea of worship, right? Maybe for you, you think worship is for those people, right? Like those really spiritual people, uh, those people who are just like always lifting their hands and maybe they just like whip out a worship flag in the middle of the song. I mean, I don't know, but, but maybe that's your idea of kind of what worship is. But can I just tell you, can I just submit to you today that every single person in the room, every single person watching online, every single one of us were created and designed and wired to worship God. Every single one of us were created to worship God. It's, it's, it's one of the greatest, probably the single greatest purpose of your life is to worship God. God. And if we're going to walk in the purpose, if we're going to walk in the plan that God has for us, we have to come to a biblical understanding of what worship really is. Uh, and I believe uh, coming to a, 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 an understanding of worship is really our greatest need. To worship in spirit and truth, it's really an ultimate privilege. To worship God, it's the supreme duty of a child of God. And as his children, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are invited, we are commanded, we are encouraged, and we are empowered to worship Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to submit to you today, if you say, Garrett, why on earth would I even listen to this? I'm not a worshiper. Why should I even pay attention? I'd like to submit to you today that as a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, being saved is not the bottom line of your story. Say, Garrett, what do you mean? You want to know why you're saved? You're saved so you can know God and worship him right? And I would go even a step further that going to heaven as a believer is not the bottom line of your story. In fact, if you are merely enduring worship here on earth, you're going to be remarkably disappointed when you get to heaven. You say, why is that? Because in heaven, we're going to be worshiping King Jesus. And y'all, I can't wait. You know, the Bible talks about these remarkable praise parties that are taking place and will continue to take place in heaven. The book of Revelations talks about them in vivid detail, specifically verse uh, chapter 19. It says this. It says, I heard what sounded like a great multitude. Can you hear it? Like a roar of rushing waters, like loud per uh, peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's pretty important. That's pretty awesome. Amen, church. Oh, but it continues in Revelation chapter seven. It says all the angels, they were standing around the throne around the elders and the four living creatures. And it says, they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Oh, but it ain't done yet because you see in Revelation chapter five, it says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and a loud voice were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. He's worthy. Amen, church. Yeah, I can't wait to worship King Jesus in heaven. But can I tell you that worship doesn't begin in heaven, it begins right now. In fact, uh, the, 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 the heavens, they shout the praises of Christ. The Bible tells us that the earth bows down and sings praises to his name. You see, to worship God is among the ultimate purpose of your life. You are wired to worship. You say, Garrett, I don't, I don't worship. It's not really for, for me. Oh, baloney. <laughs> We all worship something. All of us worship something. The problem is there's only one who is worthy of our worship. Amen. 
There's only one who is deserving of our praise. And because you were created to worship God, God actually uses worship to mold us into the one that we worship or into the thing that we worship. In other words, we become like what we worship. So if you're worshiping the world, if you're worshiping the things of, uh, uh, of idolatry, then, then that is who, in a sense, you are becoming more like. But when you worship the Lord, when you worship King Jesus, when you immerse yourself in the presence of God, before the presence of God, uh, the, the, the presence of God takes residence inside of you. The presence of God makes its way out of you in worship. You see, true worship makes us more like the one we worship. You need to write that down. True worship makes us more like the one that we worship. It says so in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image, ever increasing glory, uh, uh, with, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Now today, as we, we kick off this series, specifically talking about worship, I want to read a, 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 a familiar passage for, for many of you in the room, and it might be a passage that when you think about worship, you don't necessarily associate this passage with worship. But it's found in John chapter 4, and, and Jesus is having a conversation with a woman at a well. And he's having a conversation with a woman whose idea of worship is incredibly warped. Let's check it out, John chapter four, beginning in verse three. If you'll t pay, uh, take a look at your Bible, you can see uh, the scripture on the screen. So he, Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Verse four says, now he had to go through Samaria. Pause. Now, I wanna clarify something uh, very quickly. Uh, Jesus did not have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. In fact, uh, it was really geographically out of the way. So, so, so Jesus didn't say, I, I have to go through uh, Samaria because it's the only way to get to Galilee. No, he had to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment with a woman at the well. And he said, I'm on my way to go meet this, this lady in verse four. So verse five says, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now that's an important detail. Why? Because uh, if it was noon, it was uh, a very hot part of the day. Many people were not coming to get water at the hottest part of the day. They would do that in the morning very early or later in the evening when it was cooler. But Jesus, he sat down at the well at the, uh, the hottest part of the day. And, uh, and then verse nine says, uh, or verse seven says, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples, they'd gone into town to buy food. So it was just Jesus and this woman. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus, he answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now this gets the woman's attention. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well, drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? She says, who are you? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, I give them, uh, what I give them, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus, he shifts the conversation. Y'all ready for this? He says, okay, but first, go call your husband and come back. The lady, she was stopped in her tracks. She said, uh, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said, you're right when you say you have no husband. Uh, in fact, you have had five husbands and the man that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Well, now the woman is offended. <laughs> Verse 19, sir, the woman replied, I can see that you're a prophet, but our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now she's talking religion, but look how Jesus responds in verse 21. Woman, 
that Jesus replied. Man, I just want to take a, a moment and just say, don't use that line, okay? Jesus, he can get away with it. The rest of us don't ever use that line, okay? But Jesus says, woman, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. He says, regardless, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the fathers seek. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. New Sight Baptist Church, can I just submit to you today that I think for many believers, we've really forgotten how to worship. I think in many churches across the globe, our worship services have gone from theology to meology. We've created worship to be about us. Rather than our attention being on God, rather than our focus being on God, rather than God being at the center of our worship, we've turned our eyes inward and upon ourselves. And can I let you in on a little bit of a, of a secret today? If you want to live a life of misery, the fastest way to do that is to turn your eyes inward. That's the fastest way to do it. But if you want to live a life of joy, if you want to live a life with purpose, if you want to live your life standing in the plan that God has for you, then you simply need to take your eyes off yourself. You need to simply look heavenwardly and you need to look to the face of God and you need to learn how to worship on purpose. You see, the, the woman in John 4, the Samaritan woman, she was utterly miserable. Why? Because like many of us, she never really learned how to worship. She was living a life that was self-centered. And I believe that many of us in the room, we actually identify with the woman at the well far more than we would like to admit. You see, because this Samaritan woman, she was blinded by Satan. The Samaritan woman, she was blinded by Satan. You say, what do you mean? This lady was a lady who was a slave to sin. She was constantly seeking satisfaction in the things of this world. How many, how many people in your life do you know that are like that, right? They're, they're constantly looking for satisfaction in the things of this world. This woman, she was trying to find her value. She was trying to find her purpose in relationships. And when one relationship didn't work out, she went to another relationship and to another and to another. And ultimately, it led her to live a life of immorality, she thought she could find joy in the things of life, in the stuff of life, in all of the relationships, but ultimately it left her broken by sorrow. She was broken. Now the truth is this. Life has its thrills. Amen? And the li and life is life. Life has uh, fun for a season, but true joy is non-existent apart from Jesus Christ. And the world is an excellent marketer of sin. The world is an, an incredible job of uh, of marketing sin to the world. That 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 sin is attractive and alluring and and satisfying. But can I submit to you that sin will take you further than you want to go? Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you far more than you want to pay. And it will ultimately destroy your life. And before you know it, much like the Samaritan woman, you will find yourself bound by sin. Bound by sin. Now in John 4, this lady, she was a religious woman. I mean, you can tell by the way she's uh, uh, conversing with Jesus Christ. She was uh, a religious woman and she's sitting next to Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, and all she wanted to do was talk about religion. But this religion had never helped her. This religion ha had, had no power. There's no power in religion. There's no salvation in religion, which is why Jesus wanted to sh shift the conversation from religion to worship. He says, it's not, about, it's not about the religion, it's about worship. Can I tell you, God did not create you to be a religious being. God didn't even create you primarily to serve him. God created you to know him and as a natural byproduct, worship him. And until we learn how to worship on purpose, we will never know the fulfillment and the purpose and the satisfaction that God has planned for our life. And can I just caution you, 
when a church manipulates worship and when a church makes worship routine and when a church makes worship mundane and self-centered, we have missed the mark and we have misconstrued the meaning of worship. And rather than worship being about God, we've made worship all about ourselves. And can I, can I just say, here's the problem with that. When you misconstrue the meaning of worship, your worship becomes meaningless. When you misconstrue the meaning of worship, when you take worship off of God and you apply it to yourself, you misconstrue the meaning of worship, your worship then becomes meaningless. And so to worship on purpose, to really step in the purpose that God has for us, we've got to come to understand a couple of things. Number one, we've got to come to understand the meaning of worship. This is important, you need to write this down. You need to understand the meaning of worship. John 4, when Jesus is talking to this woman, he says, you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. The, the, this woman, she didn't know the meaning of worship. Can I just tell you, worship is so much more than singing a song, amen? amen. Worship is far more than just singing a song. Worship is the adoration and the contemplation of God revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it says, worship is all of who we are, all of who we are, and responding to all of who God is and all of what he's done and all of what he's going to do. Worship is so much more than singing a song. It's so much more than just praying a prayer. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship's a lifestyle. Worship is all that we are, our body, our soul, our spirit, our mind, our emotion, our will, responding to all of who God is, all that he's done, and all that he will continue to do. Worship is a response. Now, that, that English word worship comes from the old word worth-ship. Worth-ship. And, and, and worship Really, we worship according to the worth that we place on God. We worship what we feel is worthy or of worth. And I believe how you worship, when you worship, and the way you worship is a direct revelation of what you think about God. Our worship is a barometer of how we love God, what we think of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reality is this, because God created you to worship, we are all naturally inclined to worship well. You say, Garrett, I, I can't worship. Oh, baloney. <laughs> God created you to worship. We are all naturally good worshipers. The problem occurs when we confuse who and what we worship. You see, too many times we worship things uh, that, that, uh, that are not deserving of our worship. See, sometimes we get this idea in our mind that worship is confined to three songs on a Sunday morning, but the truth is all of us worship every single day, but for many of us on our Monday through Saturday, the object of our worship isn't God, and so we really shouldn't call it worship. We should call it by its other name, which is idolatry. Idolatry. For many of us, we worship money, right? Right? Like the majority of our focus, the majority of our attention, the majority of our effort is to get more money because we, we, we want more money because many of us, we worship money, but we also worship material things. And, and if I have more money, then I can, I can get all the, 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 the best material things. I want all the best things because I'm so con consumed by, because if I can get all the best things, then, then really that will help me to, 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 to get a, a better social status. I, I worship the social status. I worship other people's opinions of myself. That's why many of us, we're willing to go into extreme debt to buy a house or a car that we can't afford to impress people we don't even like because we worship social status. Maybe for some of you, it's not so much material, but it's relational. You worship relationships, much like the woman in John 4. You find your value, you find your worth in the relationships around you. Some of you, can I tell you some of the most passionate worshipers I've ever seen? People at ball games. <laughs> Amen? I mean, I want you to think back a, a few weeks ago when, when, when the Chiefs were playing the, 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 the game at Arrowhead Stadium. It was like minus 30 degrees, y'all. There was people out there, grown adults, uh, without shirts on. Psychopaths, right? 
But can I, can I just submit to you for just a moment? Can you imagine if we had even an ounce of that sort of excitement when it came to worshiping King Jesus? Can you imagine if we came next week and, and the front row was painted up, right? Like King Jesus on their chest, right? That would be so weird, but kind of cool. <laughs> kind of cool. All of us worship. But I think one of the most devastating things of all is that for, 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 for many of us, when we're invited into moments to worship God, when we're given opportunities to worship God, much like today, the focus of our worship is not about the Lord at all. It's, a, it's, it's about us. We want worship to fit our agenda. I want to sing the songs I like, Right? I want the volume to fit my preferences. I want to sing more songs. I want to sing less songs. I want the worship to just move me. But in the most loving way possible, I just need to tell you, worship isn't about you at all. Worship isn't about you. Worship isn't about loud music or soft music. It's not about hymns or contemporary. It's not about the lights being bright or dimmed. It's not about the number of songs we sing. It ain't even about music at all, Brad. Worship is about understanding who God is, what he's done, what he's going to do, and understanding who you are in relation to the God of the universe and, and all of you responding to all of who God is because he's worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our praise. Really, the, 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 the quality of your worship has nothing to do with traditional or contemporary. The quality of your worship has nothing to do with the time frame. Oh, it's 12 o'clock. My worship shuts off at 12. Pastor, you better wrap it up. The quality of our worship has nothing to do with those external factors. The, 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 the quality of our worship has everything to do with the posture of your heart. Why? Because worship begins with thanksgiving. Worship starts with thanksgiving. Why? Because worship is a response. It's all of you responding to all of who God is. It's a lifestyle of thanksgiving. This idea, he died on the cross for our sins. He gave up his life for your life. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's the God of the universe. He's the savior of the world. And worshiping him is a privilege and he's worthy of our praise. And can I just say this? Regardless of my feelings, he's worthy to be praised. Regardless of my season that I'm in, he's worthy to be praised. Regardless of my bank account balance, he's worthy to be praised. Regardless of who who president, the president is, he's worthy to be praised. But too many times we worship God like we're at a funeral service, right? How great is our God, sing with me how, I mean, Brad, have you seen this before? It's depressing. Hey, newsflash, we ain't at a funeral. You say, how do you know? Because my God's not dead, he's alive, amen? He's not dead, he's alive. It's not doom and gloom. Our God isn't in the tomb, he's alive, he's coming again. And until he does, I hope you will find me and I hope you will join me with my hands lifted high, my heart surrendered and awe and adoration of King Jesus. Why? Because he's worthy of our worship. Amen. He's worthy. You see, to worship on purpose, we need to understand the meaning of worship, but also, number two, we need to understand the method of worship. The, how do you, worship is a response, but how do you worship? Well, in John 4, I want to read this again because uh, it, it can be a little confusing at face value, but there's so much truth here, Brad. John 4, verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Do you remember what happened leading up to this? The woman said, Jesus, give me this living water so I don't have to come here anymore. And, 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 and Jesus said, hey, okay, but go get your husband first. And she's like, oh, you've mistaken. I don't have a husband. He said, oh, no, no, I know. You've actually had five husbands and you're with someone now who's not your husband. And she's just like, excuse you, who are you? She says, sir, I see that you're a prophet or whatever. But our ancestors, we worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews, you claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. But Jesus replied, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
You see, you Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Jesus, he says that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Write that down. We need to worship God in spirit and truth. Now let me break this down. Hang with me for just a moment because this is important. For the Samaritan woman, she wasn't interested in worship. She was interested in having a theological argument with Jesus Christ because he was confronting her with her deepest need. Jesus, he revealed to her, there's a void in your life and you're attempting to fill this void with relationships, but that void can only be filled with the living water of Jesus Christ. And rather than accept that truth, this woman, she concludes, you're some sort of Jewish prophet and you think you know better than me. You think that we need to worship in Jerusalem, but our ancestors, we worshiped right here on this mountain. You say, Garrett, what's the point of this? This is significant because... This woman, she's trying to debate the place of proper worship. And to an extent, she's correct. You see, the Jews, they did worship in Jerusalem. They worshiped on Mount Zion, Mount Moriah. The Samaritans, like this woman, they worshiped there in Samaria. But understand this. This is important. Spirit, truth, okay? The Samaritans were a people group that only embraced the first five books of the Bible. Therefore, the Samaritans... They were limited in their knowledge of God. And so as a result, their worship was primarily emotional because they worshiped what they knew not. But then on the flip side, you have the Jews and they worshiped in Jerusalem and they were led primarily by the Pharisees. And so they had all of the Bible of that time. They had all of the prophets. They had all of the truth, but many times they lacked the spirit. And the Samaritans, They had spirited worship, but they didn't have the truth. And what Jesus is declaring to this woman right here is that it doesn't matter if you're worshiping in Jerusalem or Samaria. The place of proper worship is going to take place in your heart, and it will come from a place of spirit and truth. And there's two things that we must have in order to have true and proper worship, and the first one is truth, and that comes from a relationship with the Father. Write it down. It comes with a relationship with the Father. You say, what do you mean? If worship is a response to God, if worship is all of who we are responding to all of who God is, you must have a relationship with God. You must have a knowledge of God in order to worship him. In fact, you cannot worship God if you do not know God. There must be a moment in your life where you recognize who you are apart from God as a sinner and you come to the saving faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when you enter into that relationship, he becomes your father. But like we talked about last week, when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, that's not the finish line, that's the starting point. Say, Garrett, why is that? We're to continue to grow in our knowledge of God. Why? Because as our knowledge of God increases, we come to a better and a deeper understanding of God. And as a result, it affects our worship to God. In fact, I would say this, Brad, you can only worship God to the extent that you know God. You can only worship God to the extent that you know God. And this is this idea of worshiping God in truth, worshiping God in the knowledge of who he is, worshiping God for what he's done. That's the first essential ingredient in having true and proper worship. You have to have the knowledge and truth of who God is. But secondly, you must be activated by the spirit of God. You see, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says that God deposits his spirit into your life. The spirit of the living God, the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, comes to live within your life. That's pretty remarkable. Amen, church? But see, when you worship God, you have to worship God through the spirit that's within you. You cannot worship God without the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's desire is to to, uh, bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when your aim and when your purpose is in line with the purpose and the desire of the Holy Spirit, your worship is is spirit-led and the spirit of God comes out of you in your worship. I like to say it this way, and this is important. To worship God in spirit, but without truth, makes you a fanatic. To worship God in truth, but without spirit, 
makes you a Pharisee. But when you worship God in spirit and in truth, you step into the purpose that God has for your life and you experience an intimacy and relationship with Jesus Christ that's unlike anything else. True and proper worship contains spirit and truth. Now, there's one, uh, there's a third and, and final principle of worship that we need to come to understand. And, and if you would, I'm gonna invite you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis 22. And we need to, thirdly and finally, we need to come to understand the motive of our worship. It's important to understand the meaning of worship. We need to understand the method of worship. How do you worship spirit truth? But we, it is imperative we understand the motive of our worship. Why do we worship? Genesis 22. Whew. Y'all, this is so good. This is so good. Did you know the first time the word worship is ever mentioned in the Bible is Genesis 22. What's Genesis 22? Genesis 22 is, is a, a piece of the story of Abraham and Isaac. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Abraham, Abraham was a man who loved God. Abraham was a man who was faithful to God. Abraham was a man who had such faith in God that God came to him and said, Abraham, I want you to pack up all of your stuff and I want you to go to a place that I will show you. Abraham's like, okay, but where is that? He said, just go and I'll show you. Abraham was a man of faith. And Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they were faithful to God and, and, and they weren't perfect, but they loved God. And, and one of their greatest desires, one of their, their, their heart's uh, deepest uh, longings was to have a child. In fact, there was a moment where God was having a conversation with Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to go out and I want you to look up at the night sky and I want you to see the, the stars in the sky. And, and I want you to know that that too will be the number of your descendants. And Abraham's like old at this point, like old, old, like AARP was calling nonstop old. And Abraham's like, God, how, how am I gonna have all of these descendants if, if, if I don't even have one child? And God made a covenant promise with Abraham but God made Abraham wait 25 more years. It's a long time. Now, if Abraham and Sarah were old at the, the time of the covenant and 25 years has passed, now they're old, old, amen? Genesis chapter 21, God came through on the promise and Abraham's wife, Sarah, gave birth to a son and they called him Isaac the long awaited promise had come to pass because God is faithful. Genesis 21. But then you flip to Genesis 22 and you have this gut wrenching conversation between God and Abraham. One chapter later, it says this, Genesis 22 verse two. Then God said, take your son your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Wait, what? Are you kidding me, God? God, you, you made me this promise about having all these descendants and, and I waited and I waited and I waited and, and finally you gave me a son and, and, and I love him and, and he's my most prized possession and now you want me to take him and sacrifice? What kind of a God are you? That's how I would have responded. But look how Abraham responds in verse three. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey and he took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham, he looked up and he saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, he said, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham, he took the wood for the burnt offering 
and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. God was asking Abraham for the thing that was most precious to him his son. The son that that God had promised him, the the son that he waited and waited on, the son that God finally gave to him. Now he wants it back. And Abraham, without hesitation, he just says yes. That's worship. That's worship. Worship is complete and utter sacrifice. It's, it's all things yielded and given over to God at all times. It's all of who we are, everything that we have, even the thing that we think we cannot live without, it's all of who we are, surrendered to all of who God is. Because worship withholds nothing from God. Worship withholds nothing from God. Say, Garrett, I can't do that. Garrett, I I can't do that. Why would I do that? I love the story of Abraham and Isaac because there's so much parallelism between the story of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Did you catch the end of that verse in chapter 22? It says that Abraham, he took the wood that he'd cut for the burnt offering and and he placed it on the back of his son, Isaac. And then Isaac, with the wood on his shoulders, he marched up the hill where ultimately he would have been sacrificed. Now, ultimately, God provided an atonement, an atoning sacrifice, a, a ram caught in the bushes in place of Isaac. But y'all, this is the parallel. This is the gospel of the Old Testament. You say, Garrett, what do you mean? I mean, God, who so loved his son, Jesus Christ, sent him to this earth to carry a cross up a hill called Golgotha to a place where he ultimately would be the atoning sacrifice for your sins and for mine. You say, Garrett, I can't withhold nothing in my worship. I can't give God everything that I have. Why not? He gave everything he had for you. Why? So you could know him, so you could worship him so you could have relationship with him. God gave everything he had to be with you. What is it that you're withholding from God? Today, I just wanna give you an opportunity to just pause and and just right here in the seat of this, this auditorium or at home on the couch or wherever you're listening, I just want you to just pause for just a moment. I want you to just contemplate and reflect on your heart of worship. What is the condition of your heart in regards to worship? Are you living a life of worship on purpose? Does the way that you worship really reveal the the value and the worth of God? And if it doesn't, can I just say something has to change? Maybe you're withholding something from God. And today, in just a moment, you need to come to a place where you can get on your knees or you can come forward, find a prayer partner. You can just hand that over to God. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a a family member, maybe it's a a pending medical test, maybe it's your finances or your marriage. Maybe, I I don't know what it is, but you're holding on to it and and, and it's hindering your worship to God. You just need to come to a place where you can just lay it down and say, God, I'm giving this to you. I'm surrendering this to you. I'm not withholding anything from you, God. Maybe it's a sin in your life. There's an unconfessed, unrepented sin in your life that you're aware of. I feel like my worship's not getting past the ceiling. I feel like my worship is, is just lacking intimacy. It's because there's sin in your life and it's come between you and your relationship with God. Maybe for you, you can't worship the Father because God isn't your Father. You see, you're only a child of God when you come to the end of yourself and you confess your sins to God and you invite him to be the Lord of your life. That's when he becomes the father to his children. But some of you have never done that and and God's not your father, but rather you're a child of, of the enemy. You live for the world. 
And if that's you, you say, Garrett, I need to do that. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you the greatest news of all? It's called the gospel. It literally means good news. It's this. God created you to be with him. That is what worship is. It's to be with God, to, 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 to have a relation. God created you to be with him. That's why he created Adam and Eve in the garden. But, but, but something happened and sin entered into the picture and our sin separates us from God. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You've sinned, I've sinned. And that, that, that sin, it separates us from God because God is perfection and heaven is perfection. And you and I, as we are, without the sacrifice and salvation of Jesus Christ, we cannot get to heaven because otherwise heaven would be just like earth full of sin. But God loves you too much to let you bear the, the punishment for your sin. So he made a way. He gave his only son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our sin by dying on the cross for you and for me. And he was buried in a tomb. He didn't stay dead, but he rose from the grave. Paying the price for our sin, Jesus Christ died and rose again. But here's the bad news. Our sins, they cannot be removed by good deeds. You can't be a good enough person to get your way to heaven. There's not some scale of the good deeds that way. That doesn't get you to heaven. You cannot be, uh, you cannot work your way to heaven. You're saved by faith alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what the Bible says. And everyone, everyone, anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ alone has eternal life. Say, Garrett, you don't know what I've done. Hey, it doesn't matter. God does, and he still loves you. There's more grace in God than there is sin in you. But the choice is yours. You say, Garrett, what happens when I put my faith in Jesus Christ? Life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. It doesn't start when you get to heaven. It starts right here because God deposits the spirit of God within you and the spirit of God will be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll give you the hope, the healing, the love that you've been searching for. He will help you to live your life on purpose, with purpose. Life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Maybe you need to do that today. You've never done that. I'm going to ask everyone, if you would, to just bow your head and close your eyes. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right here, right now. Maybe this is your first time in church today and you said, what in the world? Hey, God's speaking to you today. You need to give your life to Jesus today. You want to call upon the name of God for salvation today. Would you right now in your heart, would you just say, dear God, right there in your seat, would you just say, dear God, in your heart, God, I know that I'm a sinner. Do you believe that? God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know I've done things I should not do. But God, I believe you love me. God, I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And God, I don't understand it all, but I believe that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose from the grave. And God, the best way that I know how, I want to turn from my sins and I want to turn towards you, God. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me from my sin. And God, I'm asking you to help me to live my life on purpose, with purpose for the rest of my days. And I pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Can we give the Lord a round of applause? Can we just say thank you, God, for for those who just made that decision today? It's the greatest decision you will ever make. I'm gonna ask you, if you would, to just please stand. We're gonna enter right now into a time of worship, to a time of worship. You see, it's, it's not appropriate to preach about worship and then not give you an opportunity to worship, amen? So we're gonna sing a couple of more songs. And I'm gonna ask right now, my prayer partners, if you would, to just make your way to the, the front of the stage. And they wanna be here to receive you. Maybe there's, there's something in your life you're withholding from God you need to give to Him. Maybe there's a sin in your life that you're holding on to. You just need to lay it down at the foot of the cross. Maybe you just need to, to just stand and worship God in spirit and truth today. Maybe for you, you need to worship with thanksgiving and gratitude. You just need to sit down. You need to turn to Mark 15 and read this, the, the crucifixion story. I don't know. But I wanna give you an opportunity to respond with all of who you are to all of who God is. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, and we're gonna just, I'm gonna open this time in prayer. The worship team is gonna lead us in this time. Holy Spirit, we're gonna invite the Spirit of God to just be with us. And I'm gonna invite you to respond. Father in heaven, God, I pray you would have your way in this place. 
and do what only you can do. God, I pray that if there's something we're withholding, that we would give that to you. God, I pray if there's something that's between us and you, God, we'd give that to you. God, I pray we would be reminded of what you've done for us, God, that you withheld nothing for us so we could come to a knowledge of salvation with you. God, I pray that we would just worship you in spirit and truth, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. If you need to come forward, would you just come? You say, Gary, people are looking around. It doesn't matter. Place they're not focusing the on you. They're focusing on the Lord. Your glory, There's prayer God partners here that love to pray with you. If you want to just pray by yourself, you can pray. To be Let's respond to God in worship today. Your presence, Lord. Your presence. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence. What is it God's saying to you today? Would you be willing to take a step of faith and respond to Him? I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. God, it's not about me, God, it's all about you. You're worthy of our praise. Declare these truths right here, right now. From the depths of your heart, God, let us be more aware of your presence. Let us become more aware of your presence. Do you mean that today? Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Come on, church, let's sing this out together with all that we have. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. 
God, we thank you so much, Lord. And God, we just want to continue in this time of worship to just lift your name. God, to just say thank you. To just declare, God, you are great. You are holy. And in you, we have life. In you, we have hope. In you, in you we experience love. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you. You give life. You are love.
He's great. Amen, church. Can we just worship the Lord? It's great to be in church today. I just want to let you know, if you're new or first-time guest, long-time member, grab one of these cards from the seat back in front of you, fill it out. If you need to take the next step, you need to get plugged in, you want to uh, get baptized, you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you just have a prayer request, you can fill that out. Put it in the box on your way out with your tithes and your offerings. We thank you so much for that. And I just want you to, to just know, we love you. We're going to continue this right uh, next week, right? And uh, it doesn't have to start, stop today and, and pick up next week. You just continue to live your life on purpose with the purpose this week. Amen, church? I love you guys. You're dismissed. See you next week.